Hello everyone. Today we'll be learning about a new sort of particle called the neutrino, hence the title of this, Neutrinos and Nuclear Forces. We'll also be learning about something called the strong nuclear force, which is what keeps atoms together. To start off with though, we'll be looking at neutrinos. So the neutrino is a sort of particle which you might not have heard about before, so be sure to pay attention and uh, learn about the interesting things that this particle does. Uh, this object, we have a photograph on uh, my right, is in fact a detector for neutrinos. As you can see, it's very big. Right, so uh, first we need to uh, explain why people first predicted the neutrino existed. So do you remember beta decay, the expulsion of an electron from the nucleus of an atom? Well, it turns out beta particles don't have enough energy. We have a graph here of uh, the energy of beta particles emitted during uh, typical beta decay. Conservation laws of momentum and energy say that there should be more energy in the beta particles than they actually have energy. You can detect the energy of a beta particle by putting it through uh, an electric or a magnetic field. And if you do that, you'll end up with a curve like this, which shows us that most of the beta particles don't have very much energy. You can see that most of them have quite a low energy, but a few have uh, larger amounts of energy. The thing is, that shouldn't happen either. Beta particles uh, were produced with a wide range of energies, which shouldn't happen according to the theory of beta decay. Beta decay says that pretty much all the beta particles should have roughly the same energy, and not this huge spread that we can see in the graph. So, uh, this guy over here, Wolfgang Pauli, proposed an explanation to why this happened in 1930. So what would you suggest had happened if you figured out that the beta particles were behaving strangely and didn't have enough energy? Well, Pauli figured out a way to say where the missing energy had gone. He suggested that there was a new type of particle that was emitted during beta radiation and just wasn't being detected. So the second particle would be small, and massless so that it couldn't be detected, but it would have lots of speed and momentum so it could carry off all the missing energy of beta decay. So the second particle he called the neutrino, or little neutral one. His original name for it was the neutron, but a different particle got named that, so this one is called the neutrino. It contains large amounts of energy because it's got to account for the missing energy in a beta decay, uh, but it's almost massless. For a long time, people didn't even think neutrinos had mass, but very recently some experiments have shown that they probably do. So its presence in beta decay explains where the missing energy goes. We can see here a sort of modified equation for beta decay. Uh, in previous uh, lessons, we've learned that uh, carbon can decay into nitrogen if it releases a beta particle, but what we didn't point out was that there was also another almost invisible particle coming out as well. And so that's called the neutrino. So Pauli's explanation was purely theoretical. He said, there's missing energy somewhere, so we'll put it in this invisible massless particle. And that'll explain where it goes. Uh, but no one was really very satisfied with that because how could you test it? Um, and no one really knew whether the maths would work either until this guy came along. So Enrico Fermi took this postulation of the neutrino and figured out exactly how all the mass would behave and it turns out that it manages to precisely explain the energy curve of beta decay. So uh, it turns out that if you put in a neutrino into the model it'll predict that curve very very nicely. So the total energy of the neutrino in the beta particle is about constant which is just as you would expect because beta decay is meant to have around a constant amount of energy. So the first neutrino interaction was observed in the 1950s and it was very, very difficult to do. Neutrinos, as I said, are chargeless, almost massless, and move very, very fast. So you're lucky if you manage to see even one. In this uh, circled part of the diagram over here, it's pretty difficult to see, but you'll notice that there are two sort of splitting lines coming out of nowhere. What's happened is that an invisible neutrino 
has struck a charged particle and caused it to start moving. And so the neutrino has come from the bottom right hand of the photograph and collided with a charged particle right in the middle of that yellow circle. So uh, we have a few properties of neutrinos that we've learned about now. They're almost massless, not quite completely massless, as was believed about 10 years ago. Uh, they travel close to the speed of light, which is why they have so much energy. A few years ago, people thought they traveled at the speed of light, but now we think that's not quite true. They have neutral charge, not positive or negative, makes them very hard to find. Uh, they possess energy and momentum, which is why they can carry energy out of beta decay. And they possess quantum spin, uh, which explains another aspect of beta decay that was previously uh, not very well understood. So beta decay is one source of neutrinos, but it turns out there is another source, which we can see in this photo over here, and that is the sun. Nuclear fusion, as it happens, also produces a lot of neutrinos, especially if you're producing neutrinos on the same scale as the sun. Uh, every second, in fact, so many neutrinos come from the sun that on every square center on, on Earth, you get tens of billions of neutrinos passing through it every second. And we don't notice it at all. It just uh, sort of illustrates how tiny and hard to detect neutrinos are. So because they're so small and neutral, uh, <laughs> they are very, very hard to detect. But what we have uh, on the left over here is a neutrino observatory built especially for trying to detect neutrinos. Neutrino detectors are these huge gigantic tanks full of water and photomultiplier tubes. And the theory is that when a neutrino passes through water, it might slow down just a little bit and that will release a tiny bit of light and the light will be picked up by the photomultiplier tubes and if everything goes well, they'll produce a slight sort of click of current and they'll say, oh, a neutrino. The thing is, you don't really get very many neutrinos interacting with the huge tank of water. Uh, the observatory has only managed to detect about one neutrino a week, or sorry, one a day, or about 10 a week, maybe five a week. It just goes to show how difficult it is to detect the billions of neutrinos with even a gigantic tank. As it turns out, uh, neutrinos from uh, extrasolar locations, such as supernovae or other stars, because they don't interact with anything on the way to Earth, they'll manage to reach Earth as well. And it means that if a supernova goes off, we'll suddenly get an increased amount of neutrinos reaching the Earth. And it means we might be, even be able to detect something like 10 in a day. All right, so that's the end of the theory. We learned what neutrinos are and where they come from. Let's go on to some questions. Question one, at what speed do neutrinos travel? Remember, this is a question that was in a bit of debate until recently. So the speed of sound is way off. Uh, speed of sound is about the speed of air molecules. Neutrinos travel much faster than that. They wouldn't have enough energy if they traveled at the speed of sound. So how about the speed of electrons in the solar wind? That's much faster. It turns out that even though the solar wind moves at about 400,000 kilometers per second, it's not fast enough. Sorry, 400,000 meters per second. Uh, the speed of light was the sort of working answer until quite recently. But now that we've discovered that they probably have mass, it turns out that they can't travel at the speed of light. And so they must travel very close to the speed of light. The current estimates say that they travel at at least 99.998% of the speed of light and probably faster than that. But as I said, we haven't really pinned them down because they're very hard to observe. So we can see that B is the correct answer as our current knowledge of physics states. Question two, what is the mass of a neutrino? Once again, this is a question that was in a fair bit of debate until recently. Uh, so we have a few options here. I'll start off with the least likely, the mass of a neutron. A neutron is an uncharged particle, and it's a nucleon, so it contributes to the atomic mass of an atom. Neutrinos do not contribute to the atomic mass of an atom. They are way too tiny. They're thousands of times lighter than even an electron. All right, how about C? Mass of an electron? Nope, still way too heavy. So 
the working answer until recently was that neutrinos had no mass. Uh, but uh, recent observations and experiments with neutrinos have indicated that they do in fact have mass, just a very small amount. So B is the correct answer as far as we know. Question three, what are the main sources of the neutrinos that reach Earth? Uh, so the, the main source is not in fact uh, experiments done in labs, but uh, the sun. The sun during nuclear fusion produces huge amounts of neutrinos, billions and billions of billions. Uh, as well as this, we can also get extrasolar neutrinos, that is neutrinos from other stars, most notably when the stars get very bright, for example, during a supernova. And finally, we also get a small amount from beta decays, but that's sort of not all that much compared to the other sources. Question four. What caused Pauli to predict the existence of the neutrino? Why did the neutrino need to exist? So the answer here is because energy was missing from a particular kind of process. Can you remember which one? That's right, it was beta decay. So Pauli predicted the neutrino because the beta particles during beta decay didn't have enough energy. There was missing energy somewhere, Pauli said, as uh, probably some sort of new particle. He wasn't actually very proud of himself for saying that because he was a physicist who believed that all predictions should be able to be tested. And at the time when he predicted the neutrino, uh, he thought that it would be impossible to ever detect. Question five. Explain why neutrino observatories detect only a handful of neutrinos every week. I mean, there are billions passing through us, right? Why can't they detect more? Well, the answer is that even though there are tens of billions passing through every square centimeter of Earth every second, they aren't very interactive. They are neutral, they have almost no mass, they can't really interact with matter very well. And so this means that detecting even 10 neutrinos a week is quite a huge achievement. And it's why it takes such huge tanks of water and thousands of dollars of photomultiplier tubes. Well, that's the end of the questions. So in this section, we've learned about neutrinos, their charge, their mass, a bit of their history. In the next section, we'll be looking more at the strong nuclear force.